evening and uh, welcome to, um, sorry, I'm just making sure that the, the screens are correct. Um, evening and welcome to tonight's session of the first of our Ask the Farmer Q&A sessions for this winter. My name is Bridget Barry and of the Farming for Nature initiative and I'm joined tonight with my co-host Brendan Dumford, who is a volunteer with Farming for Nature and our guest speaker, the very first of our guest speakers for this session. Uh, Jim Cronin. Farming for Nature was set up uh, to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more for nature. Uh, one of the ways we do this is uh, each year we find ex exemplary farmers and through our annual Farming for Nature Ambassador Awards and uh, we share their stories. So this Q&A session will uh, is a great way to learn from these amazing farmers and find out what their tried and tested methods are for including and enhancing nature on their farms. So over the next hour, myself and Brendan will kickstart the session with asking our guest speaker a few questions. And if anyone in the crowd would also like to ask uh, Jim, our guest speaker, about farming for nature and what he does on his farm, feel free to write in the Q&A box uh, below. Um, so on to tonight's speaker. Uh, we are delighted to welcome one of our most recent Farming for Nature ambassadors, Jim Cronin. Jim is a horticulturalist, uh, a market gardener in Bridgetown in County Clare. And um, he, has, he farms 16 acres in East Clare. And he also carries out numerous educational courses on his land in order to encourage others to set up viable horticultural businesses through organic methods. So Jim, um, thanks for joining us tonight and welcome. Um, Thank you very much. You might just start with telling us a bit about the farm and you know, your farming system and how you incorporate nature onto this. Yeah, so, so it's a small farm, as you said, it's 16 acres. And they, so it's a marginal hill farm. That would be the classification of the farm. And so the land, the land would be, the, the land would be classified as being quite poor. You know, there's a high, a high clay content in the soil. And what you have is you have pockets of sandstone in, in, on the farm. So out of, out of the whole 16 acres, I have just about maybe three acres that you can actually grow crops on. The rest of the, the, rest of the land would be actually too marginal. Now it grows grass, but it would be too marginal for horticultural crops. Um, so, so, the, so from that point of view, the, it sort of dictates a little bit how I farm from from a horticultural point of view. And yeah, so I make best use out of the, the land that's arable, and the rest of the land in I quite happily I have grassland, you know, and I cut some hay and that type of stuff on the rest of the land. Great. Uh, yeah. So season to season, Jim, what would your kind of your, you know, if you were to take us through briefly, what would your work look like, your office as such out in the, out in the farm? Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, so from the point of view of the horticulture, um, so I start, I start sowing seeds usually on the 22nd of December. Um, I sow some tomato seeds and I might sow some salad seeds just because it's the, the day after the solstice. And in the horticulture, um, January, all during the springtime, I'd be quite busy sowing and I'd be quite busy tending the crops that are actually in the tunnels at the moment and harvesting outdoors. So that would be kind of my work in, we'll say, January, February, March. And by, by St. Patrick's Day, we we're quite busy horticulturally. You know, we have a we already have potatoes planted in the greenhouses and we've quite a lot of crops on the go. And the, the year moves along and in horticulturally then as soon as the ground is fit outdoors, usually around about April, we start tilling outdoors and then we start planting crops outdoors, April, May. And we have a period, we have a period from kind of April until early September where we have to take, where we tend the outdoor crops quite well. And we're quite, I won't say we're busy, but we have to, we put a lot of focus into those crops. 
during during the summer months. Now the greenhouses are on the go as well. And so basically what we're aiming for with the horticulture is to have 50 to have food 52 weeks of the year. And we have a wide variety of crops. Um, so we have a very definite kind of a, a sowing, a planting, a harvesting plan. And at the moment now, um, my a few days a week, I basically harvest. That's my main job. I do a little bit of maintenance in the greenhouses around uh, hoeing and tidying up crops after harvesting. But most of my work in horticulture, I don't work full time at horticulture at this time of the year now. I am, I'm just harvesting and I'm harvesting on my own. And I spend a lot of time staring into bushes. <laughs> and, <laughs> no and, harm. <laughs> and looking at, and looking at, uh, looking at slows and looking at all kinds of stuff and yeah. looking at trees and just everything. So on that, Jim, I mean, of your 16 acres, how much, how much is kind of, how much have you set aside for the business and, you know, that, that, and how much have you left for nature and is that viable? How is so, that viable? So the, na- the, the, the quality, the quality of the land here, the nature of the hill here is that um, if we stop farming, it would all cover over in black tartan bushes. That's the nature of the land here. And then within the hedgerows, there's an abundance of saplings willing to grow. So you have got sycamore, you have ash, you have holly, you have white thorn, you've got young oaks. So you just, you just have an abundance of, of, we'll say, trees and bushes that are willing to grow. And what I tend to do is I tend to let them, I kind of eyeball them and I let if I see a nice little holly bush coming, I let I encourage it to grow. That's so that's kind of so there's no shortage of wild corridors on this hill. <laughs> and there's a lot of kind of triangles and there's a lot of little places where there's you know, Sally bushes, whatever, have grown over the years. Um so whilst the whilst the holding is is I'd like to say that it's tidy, it's not manicured. Mm-hmm. That would be kind of what it looks like. Yeah. And, and then even when you're growing, do you do much biodiversity? Do you think about biodiversity much in your, and how that enhances your crops um, while you're growing, you know, I, even within the crops? Yeah, I do because, because there's, if, so for instance, if, if you saw the clip in from the farming from nature um, so one of the things i do is i raise thousands and thousands and thousands of flower plants every year and i've got a whole selection of flower plants that i have kind of developed over the years or evolved to over the years such as cosmos corn flower that type of stuff and one of the very first things that i do in my garden is that i i create these corridors of of various flowers. So I might have a corridor which would comprise of 500 cosmos plants running down through the central spine of the garden. Then on the, maybe on the left hand side of the garden, I might have 500 calendula running down on the bed. And then on the, on the far off right hand side of the garden, I might have 500 rhodbeckia running down along. And so that's just one small thing that's going on. And basically what's happening is that between those, between those banks of flowers, what you've got is you've got a multiple, you've got all these insects moving and you've got all these biodiversity moving between the, between the corridors. And that has a phenomenal effect on the, on the pest control in the garden okay. and on pollination and yeah it has a phenomenal effect so in simple terms they get so distracted by by these other plants that they tend to leave your your business as such your business plants alone not not quite entirely so to give you an example uh, so half an acre of potatoes mm. 
so half an acre of potatoes in the garden and they're next to the corridor of uh, calendula and in between all the potatoes when the potatoes are up nicely we drop in maybe a, a hundred a hundred or two hundred calendula plants into the potato plot into the half acre we plant them in and there is there is a whole there is a so if it's carry viruses and there is 36 viruses that can affect potatoes and the aphid is the vector and the story about aphids this is just one of the stories about aphids the story about aphid is that the aphid the aphid the aphid has to have a host plant to arrive to the garden or it has to have a plant that will bring it into the garden so the very first the very first host plant that will bring an aphid into the garden or into a polytunnel is is a calendula by the nature of the calendula the aphid arrives to the calendula and lands on the calendula in preference to the potato but then the the ladybird gets the signal that the that the calendula is populated by aphids the ladybird arrives and starts to eat the aphids more importantly the ladybird lays its young on the calendula plant the young hatch out it's the young of the ladybird that actually eats most of the aphids in nature and so they control they have a food source they control the aphid and the aphid is no longer there in your potatoes to carry the vector is no longer the vector of the virus disease so there's a method to your madness that every plant that you're planting beside your crops has a reason to be there yeah yeah, yeah. and the thing plant. but the interesting thing as well bridget is that in order to to go on this journey of biodiversity in in a market garden to go on this journey of biodiversity what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to raise plants or sow seeds of plants that will grow well in irish conditions you have to be able to plant them in such a way in the garden that they do not become a major problem having to hand weed them they have to grow well organically and they have to flower for a long period and what i like about them now i have an add-on to them what i want now is that the calendula have are almost are finished flowering now virtually and i've left all of the flowers in situ and so what you have now is your flowers with seed heads and kind of gone a bit woody Mm -hmm. And when you look carefully at those banks today in the garden, there is a myriad of insects crawling on the ground, crawling around the plants. And then every time I go into the garden, there's a flutter of birds coming up out of them. So it's, it goes on and on. The whole it's a great process. circle there. So yeah. Jim, so you've talked about your wildlife corridors. You've talked about some of the biodiversity you have between your crops under the ground soil fertility how important is that to your business so so it's it's uh and what do well, you do the, to 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 enhance it sorry yeah so can i can i just say one other thing before i move on mm -hmm. does this does this brilliant saying in the world in the world of biodiversity uh as above so below as above so below and what, they, what they're finding now, um, various soil scientists, etc., is that if you go into your garden or you go onto your farm and you see, you see a population or you see, you see a significant amount of insects and birds over your field or over your garden, if you, you look and you say, wow, what an amount of insects, what amount of birds, you can take it that the same activity is happening underneath the soil. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a very important thing as regards soil health, that you have all this 
myriad of life form going on underneath the ground as well, you know, yeah. So for the conventional farmer that sees insects as pests, you see it as kind of a thriving ecosystem, but then also underground, you see that as a thriving ecosystem. So can you maybe talk to me a bit about the fertility of the soil and the importance of that? Like, would, would your business survive without fertile soil, obviously, but, uh, or how do you enhance it, Jim? So how I, how, I, how I enhance it is I make, I make very good use of cover crops. So I make very, very good use of cover crops um, and in order to build the soil biology, in order to mine nutrients from the ground that are already in existence in the ground and to, and to suppress weed growth, I suppose, would be one other thing. So I make good use of, of cover crops and then I, I try to make really good compost and I apply this really good compost onto a living green crop. And that is my method of building soil fertility. But also tied in with that is that um, the fact that I'm organic is helpful and my tillage has to be passive. So by that, I mean, if my tillage, if my tillage is aggressive, I'm basically damaging the soil structure and I'm damaging the soil biology. And then I'm taking a step backwards. Okay. So, I love, oh yeah, sorry. So, so, by, so people, people, you know, we used to think when we, when we were started out in organics, and like I'm trained conventionally on, in conventional horticulture and conventional agriculture. And when, when we started out in organics, we just thought just fire on piles of dung just fire on piles of dung and it'll, everything will be fine. You know, just throw on lots of wet dung. And, but what we found over the years now is that it's a lot subtler than that. And basically what we're doing now is we're, so we used to be putting on something like 25 tons of wet dung per acre uh, mm -hmm. in order to grow crops. Mm -hmm. and, and now we try to put on five ton of compost and a cover crop per acre to grow better crops. Okay. So it's a learning so quite, process. Quite a, quite a mind shift. Mind shift. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you talk about your kind of your, ch in the video and if, if the participants tonight haven't seen Jim's five minute farming for nature video, you can see it on our YouTube channel, but you talk about your chocolate cake compost and that kind of really stuck out for me. Um, I won't ask you the ins and outs of compost cause that's an entire you know, months worth of learning in itself. But just very quickly, Jim, I know you have livestock on your on your farm and you just spoke about there about dung, obviously, and stuff. But actually, how important are the cattle to mix in with in making this chocolate cake compost? Is it so they're they're a very they're a very important component. Um they're a very important component because basically they're they're bringing nutrition to the compost and they're also bringing bringing biological life to the compost that's you know and and in some ways as well i, I kind of i if the if the if the cattle if the cattle are nervous and stressed and they're upset and they have poor herbage they don't make nice dung mm. it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to figure that out. Um, whereas if the animals are in, in good condition and they're well looked after, they make this lovely kind of lovely mice dung. Mm -hmm. And and that that product is very is very nutritious. And and if you can if you can manage to compost that, what you're doing basically is you're enhancing the, the fertility of it and you're multiplying it up. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening with it. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Um, Jim, uh, just you do a lot of it, I mentioned at the beginning, and then I'll, I'll move on to Bren. Uh, Brendan might be asking you a few questions in a sec. Um, but you meant, uh, I mentioned earlier that you do a lot of education on your farm and, you know, uh, and you've kind of, you, you, you spread your knowledge amongst the community. Can you maybe, um, how important is this to your, 
to your day-to-day, -day, what you do in, in incorporating education in what you do? So it's quite, it's quite important. Uh, so from a few points of view, um, so one thing was that I, I went to, I went to Warrenstone Horticultural College and I had this, this, and the people, the, so basically Salesian brothers and Salesian priests took upon themselves and nuns took upon themselves to educate young people in the art of farming and horticulture in the, in the seventies, in the sixties and seventies, from the foundation of the state onwards up until recent times. And they were an amazing group of people, the, the, these religious people. It was their life vocation to educate us and, and give us this amazing skill to be able to grow food and tend animals and all of that kind of stuff. And then, then Warrenstown, it closed and it faded away. And, and I just kind of saw that there was, a lot of, there was a lot of people and they wanted to kind of learn this, what I call classical horticulture. This kind of um, this horticulture where you learn by doing with your hands, and that you kind of learn the old basic principles of life cycles. You know, you learn about a life cycle of a pest. You learn about the life cycle of the plant. You learn a bit of soil science. That kind of old-fashioned horticulture. And I just saw that that was that was sort of missing from from education in horticulture in Ireland. So. Uh, nobody would listen to me nobody was kind of interested in my kind of idea they just thought I was cracked and <laughs> lots of other things so i decided to start teaching people myself yeah. that i set up and the first year i had four people and four guys it was pretty intense now having four people and i wrote the course from my old horticultural notes as i went and then it gained momentum and now i've, I've been doing it for for seven, something like 17 years or something mm -hmm. And I've had lots of students. Yeah, so that's how I got into it. So you yeah. practice, um, you know, I, I heard you at Biofarm, obviously, and you were talking about biological uh, agriculture. And, you know, there's loads of terms floating around like regenerative, biological, holistic management. They all cross over a lot. Would you identify particularly with one? And if so, can you explain it? Or do you just, uh, have you got your own term, Jim? <laughs> 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 the, I, uh, I, I don't like, I don't like labels really, mm. you know, and, and the other thing I, what I often say to people, okay, I'm certified organic, um, but most, most of the people I hang around with are, are very hardcore non-organic farmers. That's, they're the people that I hang out with because they're the people I learn from. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of look, I see it's just an, a cake for everybody. Um, but I like the term biological because, because the, the nearest definition of biological, it's about enhancing the life of the soil. That's one of the definitions about biological. And, and I, just, I just think that if we, we, need, if we, have, we need healthy soil, basically, in order to have to have healthy food and to have healthy animals and to have a healthy landscape and you know that's a very important thing so and then I, I like soil as well I'm interested in how soil works and you know all the nutrients and all that kind of stuff I'm a bit nerdy about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Tell me Jim before I hand you over to Brendan and um, what is if you were to give one piece of advice to conventional farmers your, your friends your buddies that you like to hang out with yeah. Um, on how to incorporate, like one thing that they could do to incorporate nature on their farm from your learnings, where, where do you think they should start? Where you, where you can, it's very simple. Uh, the first thing you can start is by observation. That's the first thing, just observing, have, observing your own farm. And then the second thing is one a great thing is we'll say that every year say i'm going to buy i'm going to buy a hundred white horn quicks and i'm going to buy a, i'm going to buy 50 trees and i'm going to learn how to plant them properly or really well I'm going to learn the technique how to how to plant them that they grow and they grow 
where they do weekly and all that kind of thing. And then what I would do is I'd identify gaps in the hedgerows and little corners here and there where I could enhance my farm. And it might be that you plant maybe, and I know a neighbor here has done this, it might be that you plant maybe eight, six or eight white thorns together and they grow into a little thicket. It might be just a little corner. And the enjoyment that comes from that is just unbelievable. It's just, just looking, you know, looking at mountain ash growing is just, phenomenal and seeing mountain ash in flower and seeing mountain ash with its berries you know it's just and that would be my start <laughs> it's a good start it's a good start you know yeah. yeah um i'll hand you over to brendan now just for anyone that's listening if they have a question for jim there's a chat section on your banner so you just type in your question there and uh, and we'll ask jim as many questions as we can get to okay thanks jim i'll hand you over to brendan there thank you yeah, thanks. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm, I'm on the other side of Clare from Jim. I'm in North Clare, but uh, the broadband isn't that great here. So, uh, Jim, thanks very much. Um, it's really interesting. Um, every time I hear Jim, I think I learn something um, new. And I've been privileged to see him and his beautiful horses up here in the barn uh, during our Wintridge Festival uh, a few years ago. And it's really a wonderful sight, uh, just an amazing thing. I, I, I myself grew up on a farm in Waterford and we didn't have horses like that. We had, a, I remember had a donkey. My father used to use a donkey for um, harrowing the, 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 the turnip grills and things like that, but it was nothing near as majestic, Jim, as some of your horses. I just wanted to, again, encourage um, audience members, because this is really for them to learn, uh, to, to post your questions in the chat and, and we, we, we'll ask those. But I just wanted, Jim, to ask you a few general questions, just about, you're, you're growing up and um, did you grow up on this farm or what was your background in farming? How did you combine um, uh, your career so, as a farmer? So, my, so I didn't grow up on this farm. I bought this little farm uh, 32 years ago. So, so my parents both came from farms in County Limerick and then through circumstances, my, my father was a sergeant in the guards and he ended up he ended up, my parents, when they got married, they left the, they left the farm and they, they left my father's, my, my father's father far, father's farm and they went to living in a diamond and they, he was working as a guard and we were, we were living on the edge of the town <clears throat> and my parents then, of course, great family, nine children and to, to supplement the, the guards pay was quite poor at that time. I'm talking about the fifties now, um, fifties, sixties. To supplement the, the income of the guard, my father, he rented three acres on the edge of the town. And we had a, we had a market garden there. We were growing vegetables and selling them around the town of Innesteinen. And, and then when we were, when we were quite young then, I was probably nine or 10 or so, we, we inherited one of the, we inherited my father, my grandfather's farm basically, from my father's side. We inherited that farm in County Limerick and then we started, we started farming that and looking after it and minding it, as well as continuing to live in the Steinman. So that was, that was kind of my, one of my connections. And then my other connection was with my maternal, um, grandparents. I w actually went to live with them when I was three and a half and for about a year and then I went and then every I created this bond then with, the, with my grandparents and so every year then I went there all my holidays I spent there on the farm with my grandfather uh, going around doing jobs and all that kind of stuff. So yeah so always connected to farms and I, I, I hated being a townie. <laughs> I wanted to be, I wanted to be living all the time in my, when I, even I'd be in school, I'd be looking at the clock and thinking about what my grandfather was doing. <laughs> I always wanted to be back in that farm. I just, uh, it reminds me of a book I just finished there by John Quinn uh, and his father was a guard as well and he said he was a kind of a, 
a full time farmer, part time guard because he loves standing yeah. in the farming so much. It's kind of like yourself. So you were kind of immersed in farming, Jim. But then when he went to Warrenstown, which I've heard so many great things about, did the kind of the, the hands on practical knowledge that you learned with your parents and grandparents was that um was that I, I suppose supplemented or complemented by what you learned formally in college, or did you find there was a disjoint between the two? No, it was totally it was totally complemented. So like suddenly I was sitting in this class in in Warrenstown and they were explaining to me about germination, you know, and explaining the whole process of germination. And and I was looking at this I never had a boring day in Warrenstown. I just sat there and just was there for years. It was like one continuous enchanted holiday. <laughs> It was just phenomenal to be sitting there and to be immersed in this subject um, that I loved. And on the first day, the, the brother, Brother James O'Hare, who was the principal, he said he stood in front of us and there was, there was 30 people, 30 students, all boys, all young men. And uh, he said, we all have one thing in common here. I, I can guarantee that every one of us uh, has loved to sow a seed since we were a child. That was what he said to us. And it was so true. Uh, we sat there and there was, you could talk like there was 31, 30 students and everyone, every single person was passionate about this subject. So it was, it was quite an amazing experience. Yeah. What a wonderful. And I think it sounds like you're, you're, you're one of their best pupils, Jim. And then when you came back onto the piece of land, did you have to, you know, every field and every farm everywhere in the country is that bit different. Did you have to learn your way into the land that, then again in order to apply those, 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 what you learned in college? Or is it a case of I, trial and error? Or when you're starting off, how did you, how did you, how did you work? So when I, when I came here, for instance, Brendan, when I came here, when I came here to this little farm, um, there was a brother and sister living next door. So who was living here on this hill were kind of brothers and sisters that had never married. And they were, they were, in, their, they were in their late 60s, early 70s. And they were farming in a very traditional way, in a very, um, yeah, in a very traditional way. And they were very, very proud of this hill. And of course I was all ears and they just taught me everything. They taught me everything. Like I remember one time I had a cow calving and I was quite worried about her. And I uh, did, the neighbor next door had instructed me to let her calve out in the hill that she would get her own spot to calve and she would be quite okay. And I was quite worried about her and I went up to look at her. Oh, he said to me as well, don't present yourself or you'll put her off calving. Let her do it herself, she'll be fine. So I went up anyhow, and I went up to have a look. I sneaked up to have a look to see how she was getting on. And just as I was getting nearer, I, I just heard a, a little branch crackling. And I heard him saying, come here, come here. <laughs> and it was the neighbor. He was actually watching the cow as well. And he said to me, she's perfectly okay. Don't interfere with her. And it was from those people that I learned. I learned all about the wind and I learned all about the wind direction and what's happening and, and frost and oh, just an amazing amount of stuff, you know, and, and I was all ears <laughs> and we were, you know, we were saving hay and I was helping them save hay and it was just amazing. Yeah. And they, they had a tradition this, in this area. Of... Pardon? Sorry, Jim, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, they, they had a tradition in this go area. Ahead, Jim. Sorry, growing... I interrupted Okay, so they, they had a tradition in this area of growing maybe about an acre of potatoes and delivering them into Limerick City. That was the tradition. So they actually have, in this area of East Clare, there's, a bit, there's quite a bit of experience of tillage as well. And, uh, and I learned a lot from the people here around that, around how to till the land and all of that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. So they were my mentors, the old people. Sometimes you wonder, is that, is that, yeah, is that, is that level of knowledge um, still available? Uh, I guess in the last 30, 40 years, we might have moved away from it a little bit, but I think a lot of it is about 
being a good listener as well because there's a lot of accumulated wisdom in the countryside if you're if you can access it yeah yeah and and even at the moment brendan you know as as uh, as bridget was saying you have this conversation about regenerative farming uh, mob grazing you know all these type of terms now around how to use land and how to grow grass and utilize it with animals and sometimes i think those old people they had such they had all they had all that studied <laughs> at another level and they understood the plants that were grown there. And we'll say my neighbor here now, he had one particular field that he used to cut every May for, for hay for calves for the winter. And like, hay was no height at all. But as he used to say to me, May hay is like lead in, in nutrition. You know, it's really heavy hay and it's, and he would go up there and we'd be, I'd be helping him save this May hay. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of knowledge. Fantastic. Um, I might, Bridget, I might bring you back in because um, I think my Wi-Fi is poor. We've got a whole ton of questions coming okay, in. So yeah, Bridget, yeah. if you can hear me, you maybe you can um, I'll take start over. on with those questions. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jim, for that. Um, there's been a couple of uh, questions about cover crops. And uh, so I might just try to um, amalgamate some of them. But, um, but Shane O'Brien says, uh, does Jim grow cover crops after harvesting in the field? If so, do, how does he go about this? And then another question from Grace was, Christine Jones men mentions eight to nine different species within her cover crops. What works well in an Irish system? So... Yeah. Yeah, so 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 the so we'll we'll talk about horticulture now. We'll we'll just talk about horticulture. So what what happens sometimes, Grace, is that I take on board fully what what um, Christine Jones is saying. But what happens sometimes in horticulture is that that single species work best on at certain times of the year. So that's that's one thing that happens because we're actually incorporating we're incorporating the cover crop at a very young stage. It's very very different to an, an agricultural setting or a you know a tillage set, a, a grain setting, let's say. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing, then, if I said quickly off the top of my head, what works well in so you have warm season cover crops and you have winter cover crops. And what works well in Ireland is that uh, cereal rye and winter vetch works very well for the winter. Or black oats, cereal rye, winter vetch works very well for the winter. And then for the summer periods, you have buckwheat, crimson clover, uh, summer vetch, uh, phacelia, sunflowers, lupins. Um, yeah. So there's a whole host of those kind of summer crops that work well. So depending, depending on the time of the year, but um, so if you were going, if you had a, you could, if you're going for longer than, than we'll say three or four or five months, you'd go into multi-species. But if you're actually going for a quick turnaround, you usually use single species or only one or two species in the mix. Okay, yeah. and this yeah. is in a horticultural setting. Because actually there's That's another question settings. here from a William Tyndall who's, who says, Jim, you mentioned herbage there for your animals. Which herbs work best on an Irish pasture? I'm looking to plant some uh, with legumes and grass and fields that have been quite heavily farmed with cereal crops for a number of years. Again, if that's moving away from horticulture, that's okay. But yeah, no, that's fine. So... So what, what, I, what, I do in the, what I do in the grassland is I identify, identify what's growing wild. If it, and if it's not growing in my field, I find, a, I find a place nearby on the same hill, the same soil type, and I identify what's growing wild. And then I work backwards from there. So I'd see, so I quite obviously would see white clover. I might see a particular type of red clover. Um, you know, I might see vetches, um, and then I work back from there, and it's only, and then I, and on top of that, then I match whatever I intend to put into the grassland with what suits the soil type from your particular farm and the pH. 
you know, and the, actually the stone as well, whether is it limestone, is it granite, what is it? So I gather all that information together and then I very judiciously introduce the seed. And if, if I can at all, I don't plow. <laughs> if I can at all, I don't plow. So what I try to do is I'd, I'd graze it bare and I go with something like a nine buck harrow and something like a cedar, uh, an air cedar, very, very simple air cedar. And I put the seed, put the seed onto the, onto the surface and harrow it in. But in order for that to work well, you have to understand how germination works and you have to be quite good at germinating seed and you have to be quite good at nurturing seedlings. And if you get, now that's easily learned, but if you get the kind of the sense of that, you'll begin to understand that, okay, now is optimum time to sow clovers and vetches, for instance. And I'm talking into a grassland situation now. And you'll identify, I've got enough moisture, I have enough soil temperature. I don't have, the sun isn't too high. And I don't have, I don't have, I won't have grass cover competing with them while they germinate. And my fertility is right. And my nitrogen status is right. And if you get all those ticking in together, you, you actually can very, very successfully introduce new species into, into grassland. Okay. But it's quite an art to get it right and mm -hmm. to do it properly. Yeah, mm -hmm. but very doable. And I often, what I often do with people is I get them to start, start small, start on maybe half an acre. And a bit like what Brendan was saying, get, glean the knowledge from somebody about how to do it mm -hmm. and then move forward slowly. I was actually, that was what I was going to ask from that is, I suppose if the knowledge, if you, like say it, it's not there because you're surrounded by conventional farmers, maybe, um, is there anywhere that you would suggest that people go for advice and support if they have lots of, or, you know, or what course, anyone know of a course in uh, horticulture? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but you know what I mean? Just uh, if, if people do, you know, where would you find your advice and support or you gleaned it from neighbors and experience obviously, but. Yeah, but I, I'm still learning Bridget. I'm still learning. So I, I get it everywhere. I get it from the most unlikely sources. Um, you know, so I might, I might pick up bits from, from farming magazines, you know, I might pick up our newspapers, wherever. I kind of ho hoover up all kinds of stuff. And, and then, you know, for instance, at the moment now, after the conference, the biological conference, I, I, was, I was quite impressed by Greg Judy by one of the, the mob grazers. And uh, I was quite impressed by his talk. So I ordered his book immediately and I'm reading the book. Um, but in, in his book already, there's a, there's a lot of information that's relevant to horticulture. So that's, that's where I kind of get my information. I get bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. and, and even in other place where I got, say a few years ago, I was kind of interested about, there was a particular issue with getting cover crops to germinate. And I was kind of a bit, a bit baffled by that. And I saw that the, in Johnstown Castle, two guys, two of the agricultural researchers had done a lot of research on barley and oats. Um, and I thought, oh yeah, they probably have the information that I need on germination of, of cereal, rye, etc. So I made it my business to meet them at the Plowing Championships. Now they're total conventional guys. <laughs> and I made, it, made my business to meet those guys. And then, of course, they give me they give me their research information, and of course, I read that then, you know. So that's kind of it's, you find it in all kinds of places. Um, and if somebody at one, I was thinking about this before we came on, uh, and like I have a few one if, anytime I'm interested about wildflowers and how they grow, uh, John Feehan, mm -hmm. I watch closely, and I have his book worn to a thread, wildflowers of County, County Offaly. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of people like that because John Feehan, what he does is he describes how an orchid grows and you think, oh yeah, wow, that makes perfect sense. And then, you know, one thing leads you on to the next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
No, no, it's, it's really interesting. And I think the amazing thing is, is even though Ireland's very small, the amount of different land types, that one size doesn't fit all. You kind of nearly need to research for your own field and your own area and your own system. Okay, yes. so Jim, moving on, um, uh, Linda here has said, we have 10 acres of well-drained fertile soil in Meath and we started managing it ourselves. Uh, we will start managing it ourselves next year. Nitrates have been applied to the soil for several years. What would you do to improve, improve the soil health, Jim? So, so what, well, it depends, it depends what direction they're going to go with the 10 acres. Um, you know, so let's just say they're going to grow grass. Let's just say they're going to grow grass. Um, I suppose uh, what I, what I would do is I would I would I would let I would let a season develop and see what happens. As in, decide okay, we're going to we're going to cut hay off it, or we're going to we're going to bale silage off it or we're going to graze it or whatever we're going to do. But I would farm it and I'd farm it in a particular way. But I'd, I'd kind of keep my powder dry and I'd just see what happens with the grass and, and even see what weeds are growing there, you know. And then um, what I would try to do then is I would try, I would try to avoid compaction and by heavy machinery. And I'd take a soil test, and then I'd f take an educated, um, uh, what's the way? I'd, I'd educate myself how to introduce multiple species. That's what I'd do, you know. And I'd, I'd kind of think, okay, I'm going to start seeding, you know, species in September. That's going to be my time. So. Be between now and September, I'm going to have plenty of time to watch my land and see how it is. And then I'm going to have enough research done to know what species will do well there. Mm -hmm. And by September then I'll start, maybe do a couple of acres with multi-species would be kind of my game plan. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Lucy Moore asks, is a cover crop the same as a green manure? And when do you advise yeah. sowing this? Um, I have found that the vegetable crop is in place when I plan to sow a green manure. Is that okay? Oh yeah. So so cover crop and green manures are the same thing. And if you look at it from the point of view of protecting soil health and, and building biodiversity, um, what you would do is uh, so you, you plant you have your crops and when your crops are finished, you'd you'd sow a cover crop in order to protect the soil. So that would be one of the avenues that, that you'd have. Um, so on a practical example is that as you dig your potatoes, you'd, you'd follow on with a cover crop, with mm -hmm. a short term cover crop, such as facilia or buckwheat, you know. Um, and there's a kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, maybe paradox is the word, or I'm not quite sure what the word is, or there's a conflict of interest maybe in some ways, because when you're, when you're building, when you're building, uh, when you want to build soil health and when you want to build soil structure and when you want to build soil nutrition, you normally incorporate the cover crop pre-flowering because, because otherwise the goodness goes up into the seed head mm -hmm. and some of it actually escapes into the atmosphere. And if you're, so if you're farming for soil health, if you're farming for all those things, you're, you're, pre-flowering in cooperation and then if you're farming for biodiversity above the ground as in insects and birds etc um, you let it go to flower okay. okay so what you'd see in my garden going on again you might see corridors or you might see areas and you see some that are just young and, and juicy and they're about to be incorporated into the soil and then you'll see another, you'll see a multi-species one on the edge of the garden or somewhere made up of 10 or 12 or 14 um, ones. And they're just in these splendid array of flowers. Mm -hmm. So the, the two are going on, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, Jim, a question here from Joanne Coughlin. How do you manage rabbits? Uh, so we don't, we don't have rabbits because somebody introduced myxomatosis to this ah. hill about 30 years ago. Um, 
And the only way, the only way to manage rabbits is to make a, perim a perimeter fence. And basically what you have to do is you've got to, you've got to make a trench and you've got to bury lattice wire for a depth of 12 inches. And you've got to make a U in the lattice wire outwards, out towards the field, not in towards the garden. And that's the only way because they will burrow under the fence otherwise. Okay, so and it needs expensive. to be about three foot high. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mina asks, could you tell us more about your tilling methods? What type of machinery or animals do you use? Okay, so so I use well, I use a tractor and I use horses to till. Um, so I so I don't like inversion ploughing. So in, inversion ploughing is where you you flick over the sod and you bury it and there's basically no air. When, you, when you've turned the sod over and if you have the grass underneath or the cover crop underneath, and there's virtually, if you dug it up a week later, it, there's anaerobic conditions happening there. So I avoid that type of plowing. Um, and so what I, if I, I plow with a very particular type of plow that just kind of, if I do plow and I seldom plow, but it's not actually plowing. So I just kind of slightly flick the soil so it's standing upright um, and then there's lots of air getting into it. And then from there on in, then my tillage method is very, very passive. Um, if I'm going by horse, they're only going at three miles per hour and I'm using a springtime harrow. That's my, my main tool. And so it's a harrow with a, with a spring springtime and it, it's very gentle on the soil. And I have a very particular way of cultivating the soil. And what I do is I work, I work with the easterly winds and the sun. So I don't start until the wind goes to the southeast or the northeast uh, in the spring of the year. And then I begin my cultivation when I have sun and wind. And I begin this long, slow lead-in period of cultivation before I actually come, that I eventually have enough soil warmed up and cultivated in order that I can make a drill to plant potatoes, for instance. So I've this long, long, slow lead-in period. Okay, and sorry if I'm being slow, but the east wind is to do with the which way your farm is facing? It's, it's, or? No, it's nothing to do with that. It's, okay. it's the direction that the wind is coming from, and the east wind is, has a particular drying effect. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. And it's a very particular wind that comes in the spring of the year, every year without fail. Okay. <laughs> now, it might, it might, sometimes it might not come until May, but it does come eventually, this particular wind. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, so Rocio asks, Jim, I have plenty of slugs in my lettuces. Any advice on keeping them away, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> without so, using, you know, obviously. Chemicals. So, yeah. So you're, the soil, when you have lots of slugs, the soil, the soil is too bacterially dominated. So what you have in soil is you have a fungal bacterial ratio. And in order to grow ve vegetables, it needs to be slightly bacterial, just slightly tilted on the scale towards bacterial. And when it's overly bacterial, Overly bacterial soil comes from using uh, wet, wet, wet cow dung or wet horse animal manure, incorporating it into the soil. It comes from over cultivating, or it comes from using excessive amounts of uh, organic chicken pellets. We'll call them. That's where that's where bacterial soil comes from, and. <clears throat> Excuse me. And fungal soil comes from minimal cultivation and very sensitive cultivation. So, so the trick is to to bring your soil back towards being fungal, and and I would say look very carefully at are you over cultivating, and what is your source of fertility look at those two things very carefully and you'll be amazed how much the slug the slug will abate tied in with that is that your plants your plants have to be very healthy organic plants have to be very healthy 
And if they're very healthy, they actually, they're not attractive to slugs to eat. So by that, I mean that the plants, when, when we look at lettuce plants, we're looking at that they have to have a very particular root formation, and then they have to have a, the correct ratio of leaves overhead in relation to the roots. So for instance, they should have five true leaves when you plant them in the ground. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jim, this is from a no D. He's obviously in the similar area to you. Well, sorry, he's in Northwest Clare. Um, but he has a small suckler farm and would like to grow trees and hedges to provide shelter and improve, improve the diversity of the farm. It's open and hilly at the moment, gets strong winds. What would you recommend? What tr trees and hedges would you recommend? And any natural way to control rushes on a farm? Yeah, so, so the, trees, the trees and hedges that grow well on marginal land is uh, so the very first thing is to go out go out with your notebook and identify what's growing in that particular area so you'll come up with a list like you know white thorn um you know uh, ash sycamore whatever whatever you come up with that's in that kind of hardwood deciduous um, and evergreen even hollies and identify those plants that grow well in that area and I would, I would suggest to plant them, but they must, they must be planted, they must have dry feet for the first five years of their life at least. And so basically what I mean by that is that you've got to plant them into, if it's a wet area, you've got to plant them into a type of a raised bed. You've got to make some kind of a bed on the edge of the field, you know, it's maybe some, some compost and things. I mean, family of manure now and some soil and make a bed and plant them into this bed so as that they get a head start. If they're planted into, into subsoil or poor hill land and their feet are continuously wet for 10 months of the year, they won't do. Mm -hmm. So you have to nurture them along. And the other thing that's very important is to plant to, if at all possible, to try to get plants that are raised in Ireland, if possible. And for instance, <clears throat> with, with Hawthorne, what you can do is the slows are collected throughout Ireland. And if you, you can actually, they have a database and you can actually match it that the Hawthorne that you get for your farm in North, North West Clare or wherever, that the, the, the hawthorn that you get back is as near as possible to your soil type. And that actually makes quite a difference. I was actually so, going to ask that, Jim, is there a national, is there kind of a national body you'd recommend for people to get there? Or are you saying to try and, if people aren't able, sorry, to, to grow their own and don't have the time or, or hmm. maybe the knowledge around growing their own, is there, where would you recommend that people got, is it from local nurseries or is there a national body that you'd recommend that so, got their trees? Well, I'd, so I'd, I'd start with Quilche, strangely enough, you know, and I'd get some of that information from Quilche because they're involved in that database, database for the white one, for instance. Um, and then, then sometimes what you get is you get, you get people that have an interest in growing trees and they might have a small little tree nursery, um, you know, and so they would be kind of my, my port to call, you know, or even over in Wicklow you have, you have nursery growers. So I'd go for source. Mm -hmm. I'd go for the, you, in the Farmer's Journal now you see, you see people advertising and I, I always ask them, are you the grower? Are mm. you the grower? Are you who are you? <laughs> and uh, because I want the grower, that's who I want to find the trees from. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I don't want them sitting in a in a warehouse for a month yeah. <clears throat> before they come to me. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, okay. here's a question from Andrew. You Andrew. want to ask me the question about the rushes? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Carry on with the. How do you control the rushes, though, Jim? So the thing about it is, so. <clears throat> So you have to, so the thing about rushes is, why are the rushes growing there? And I, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a field next door to me here, um, and uh, there was never rushes growing in it. 
There was never rushes growing in it. And the rushes only came in when the round baler came. When the round baler came. And why did the rushes come because of the round baler and the tractor? They came because the round baler um, damaged all the old stone drains. And all, a lot of our land, a lot of our, our marginal land in Ireland was, was, was drained by hand with old stone drains, absolutely beautiful drains. And with modern machinery, they have collapsed. And the, and the thing, what I, what I like to do straight away is to identify, you can almost see it, you can see the way the drains worked, ran in the field. And what I, before I do anything, I like to, I like to get the water flowing if at all possible. So I like, so sometimes it means a boundary drain, and then sometimes it means a series of little hand drains in the field. And even sometimes what I do is I leave them open for a year or so just to see what's happening and see, am I actually catching the water? And is it actually moving in the right direction? And then I may fill them in after a year, you know? And so that's my first thing. You've got to get the water away. And then, and then the second thing is then to, to see how, how you're managing the grazing pattern. And are the animals poaching the ground? And if the animals are poaching the ground, you're going to have rushes. Or if they're overgrazing, you're going to have rushes. So I would pull back on, on the grazing. And so, for instance, there's parts of this hill that is summer grazing, and it's not suitable for animals from, from October onwards. It's just end of story. It's not suitable for animals. So all the animals should be off that section of the hill from October onwards. And so I'd move along with all that. And then, uh, then I'd move on to topping. And by topping them judiciously several times a year, you will actually, you will actually reduce them as well considerably. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. Um, I also, a farmer was telling me recently that rushes are used as bedding in the winter as well for cattle when they're inside. Or, uh, have you come yeah. across that? Or? I, I have, yeah. The interesting thing is that one of my students did a whole, did an MSc in horticulture and uh, we, were, we did a whole study in, on the fertility value of rushes and they had zilch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good today. I got a question in earlier today from Douglas Allotments. Uh, Jim, how do you manage weeds organically? How do you manage weeds? Is it by hand harvesting or what no, is the trick? No hand weeding. Hand weeding is a waste of time. Hmm. So, so the so I'll I'll be very quick, but I'll I'll say one or two things. Uh, one thing is that. When, when the weed germinates under the ground, so you've, you have three categories of weeds to start with. You have annual, biennial, and perennial. And we, we're having this conversation now about annual and biennial, and perennial is for another time, because they're, they're not, we're not, it's not the same conversation. Mm -hmm. And with the annual and biennial weeds, which is what mostly grows in, in gardens, what happens is the seed germinates and when the seed germinates, it has a little, what we call a tread, before it develops its first two leaves, which are called cotyledons. And when the seed germinates and it has a tread, it has a major biological and nutritional feed for the soil biology and for the soil health. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's like having a juice shot in the morning. That's what you're giving to your soil. And one of the biggest, biggest tricks about, about controlling weeds in a garden situation or in, or in field scale is that when the weed is at tread stage, you undercut it with a hoe or some kind of a mechanical implement. You undercut it and then it dries out and it melts back into the ground. And during the growing season, once the so, and we'll talk about outdoors from from April onwards, what happens is that you have these weeds, annual annual biennials, germinating every ten days. They have a ten day pattern, 
So, so basically what you have got to do is that every 10 days, you push the hole through your garden. So you're constantly pushing the hole through your garden every 10 days. You're not waiting to see weeds. You want to see brown earth and you're pushing the hole through. And what you're doing is you're all the time building biology, building biology, building soil health. And the more you do that, the less and less weeds that will grow. Fascinating. Um, yeah. I just, because uh, I, I recognize the time and, and people, to be honest, uh, Jim, your, your knowledge and your experience is extraordinary. So, I mean, we could keep going all night. And I know that from some of the comments here, you know, people are finding it fascinating and stuff. I suppose there's one question really um, that some people have asked is, you know, is your farm open to visitors? Do you offer workshops, education? You know, what's, if people want to learn more from you, Jim, how can they do that? So I do, I, I'm a trainer with NOTS in NOTS, National Organic Training Skill Nets. And I, you know, there's a few courses I do during the year um, with them. And if you, if you contact NOTS, they'll let you know about the courses. We're just kind of putting them together now for 2021. Um, so that's, that's one, one thing that I do. And then, then every year uh, I have an open day on the bank holiday Monday. On the, in in oh, August, August, okay. But in August, the bank holiday Monday in August. But I suppose this coming year now, uh, COVID permitting, so sure, we'll have to have one for farming for nature as well, won't we? Might as well. You yeah, might as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on so to you. The farming for nature one will be um will be very focused on on biodiversity and all that kind of stuff. That'll be our kind of. I presume that will be our gig that day. Yeah, yeah, we'll try yeah. and focus on that. Yeah. Just for any of the participants, if they don't know, uh, Farming for Nature organised a series of walks with our ambassadors. So we, by the end of this year, we'll have about 44 ambassadors uh, in our network throughout Ireland from different farming systems and land types, of which Jim is obviously one. And we'll organise, hopefully, COVID allowing a series of walks between next spring and autumn on these farms throughout Ireland. So keep an eye on our website. Um, Jim, I'm just gonna hand you over to Brendan for one last question. And, uh, and then, um, but for me, I just want to say thank you so much. I've learned a lot. Um, I know I could sit here for hours, but um, it's not fair on you and allow you to get back to your, uh, you know, your work and stuff and be up early in the morning, I'm sure, harvesting. Um, before I do hand back to Brennan, I just want to say everyone in the crowd, if you haven't watched Jim's video, please do. He's got um, a video on our YouTube channel, farmingfornature.ie. And do join us for next week. We have uh, Sinead Moran, who is a micro dairy farmer up in County Mayo. And uh, you just register again through our website. So every Monday over the next couple of months, except Christmas, we will have this Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Jim. Brendan, over to you for the last question. Yeah. What will it be? Yeah, I'd have, have to roll <laughs> two questions into one. So um, the, two, the two questions are one about seed collection, Jim. Do you collect your own seed and do you have any tips on how? And the second one is, now that you solved the rushes for us, what about bracken ferns? Is there any way of managing those? So those are two questions rolled into one. Yeah, yeah. So, so bracken are interesting because under bracken, under bracken you get amazing soil. You get amazing soil. Um, it's very dry. It's very, it's very fungally dominated, and it's it's very clean. It's very clean. The, the bracken has dominated over the years, and um, like the thing, the thing is that it wouldn't it wouldn't take much if you wanted to bring it into grassland. If you wanted to bring bracken, say you had five acres of bracken and it was permissible and you wanted to bring it into grassland, it, would, it wouldn't take much to, to mulch mow it, to mulch mow it, and then to change the soil towards being bacterial. And, and how you'd probably do that is you'd probably mulch mow it, you'd mint till it maybe with, you know, something like a power harrow or something like that. And then you'd, you'd introduce You'd introduce, dare I say, slurry, or dare, dare I say, because people have slurry, but slurry with an additive, with, um, with a biological activator added during the winter in a tank 
can be amazing stuff. And if you put on some slurry onto that mintill soil and tipped it towards being biological and reseeded it, you'd be amazed. The, the bracken will no longer grow. You know, That's and, true, and, and just I, a quick one then about the seeds, uh, seed collection. Do you, do you collect your own? Yeah, so, I, so, so I'm very particular, Brendan. Um, so what happens is, if you if you're saving seed, you have to save from your best best plants. The plants have to be free of pests and diseases, and they have had to be allowed go through their full cycle without being compromised. So to give you an example, say with lettuce, yeah, you have you have a lettuce plant, and what you've got to do is you've got to let, and it makes a perfect head. You don't harvest any leaves from that head. You let it keep its, all its energy and then you let it go to seed and then you collect the seed from that. But all the way along, all the way along, this, the, plant, the lettuce plant has to be free of any kind of a pest or disease. So on a practical basis, what happens is I, I don't collect many vegetable seeds because I'm commercially orientated and I'm harvesting every plant. So I don't collect any of them. But from the whole range of my biodiversity banks, I've got all these flowers and I let them through, run through their cycle. And that's why I'm collecting a lot of seed from them. And I'm using, I'm using the same seed year in, year out of calendula and sweet pea and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, listen, I think we'll, we'll, thanks very much for that, Jim, um, and we have a great crowd tonight, and um, thanks to everybody showing up. Jim, it's such a pleasure listening to you, and I think if you're this good virtually, uh, you're going to be amazing <laughs> when we meet you out on the farm, um, so I'm looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. I think also, I just might compliment you on the fact that your, your approach is so inclusive, and I think at a time where there's so much polarisation between farm, farmers and nature, farming, the environment, and it's false, it's a false um, division, I think. But I love the way yeah. in which you so inclusively bring, bring it all together. Obviously, you're vocational about what you do, and um, we're all your disciples because we're in awe of your knowledge and your ability and your generosity, Jim, in sharing. So thank you so much yeah. to all thank of us in the, in the room tonight, all of us at Farm for Nature. We really hope, hope, hope we can talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.